I'm going to invite Aaron Lorette Forrest to read the word. We're going to be in the same passage we were in last week, uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. We're going to kind of live here for a few weeks together, trying to open this passage up to uh, mine some of the depths that are there. Luke 4, thank you. Good morning. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And then when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil a second time, I'm sorry, yeah, and the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out to all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God is faithful forever. Love the sound of the little ones running around. Such a joy. Well, let me see a show of hands. Does anyone in here like playing chess? You got any chess players in here? Okay. Good number. Good number. Well, my kids have gotten into playing chess recently, have we? Haven't we got it? No. Some of them have. Not every single one. Uh, some of them like checkers more. But, yeah. The other night we were playing uh, chess together, and one of them, I won't tell you which one, I turned my head for a moment, I heard something, I turned my head, and as I turned back, I saw some hands withdrawn from the board uh, very quickly, sneakily, had done something to the pieces there, and uh, they smiled kind of big at me and realized, I'm caught red-handed here, doing something, and we kind of laughed as we said, all right, well, we need to put the, you know, the pieces back where they were. But have you ever been tempted to do something like that before? To act dishonestly or unfairly in some way to have an advantage, right? To maybe take advantage of something. Break the rules a little bit. I'm sure you have. We all have at one point or another in our lives. Again, if we are being transparent and honest with each other. Some of you will remember just a few years ago... The Houston Astros were caught in a large cheating scandal in which the team was using the center field cameras to try and steal uh, signs from the catchers. What was going on there? Um, it was supposed to be secret between pitcher and catcher. They were using cameras to try and steal those signs. So that the batter would know which pitch was coming. I don't know if y'all heard about that or not. And it actually engulfed a few other teams and uh, it was quite the big ordeal. Well, we call this cheating, right? Now, sign stealing as a baseball player, as a guy who played baseball for a long time, is not necessarily cheating. Teams I played on did this in a way that was kind of allowed by the unspoken sort of etiquette of the game. There's a way to steal a sign that is within sort of the bounds of what is acceptable. But using technology like this, which gives an unfair advantage, is indeed cheating. Well, here in our passage before us today, Jesus is tempted by Satan to cheat. 
The word here in the Greek is a word that can also mean test. Jesus is being tested here by God, and Satan swoops in to tempt him and to try and get him to cheat, to challenge Jesus, to use an unfair advantage to pass the test. I want to take a deeper look at these temptations, these tests this morning, and think about what they might mean for us. Well, last week we began a series titled, With Christ in the Wilderness, and I started by talking about what we meant by wilderness. And a wilderness, of course, can be a deserted or an isolated literal place, but it can also be a place of hardship, a place of difficulty. Right? We might call these spiritual wildernesses. And last week we looked at this passage and saw how Jesus, in this moment, in Luke 4, is in a physical wilderness, but also at the same time, in a spiritual wilderness of sorts. We focused on that first verse, those of you who are here will remember, focused on that first verse where it says that Christ was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and we tried to unpack some of what that meant and what it meant for us. God leads us into such places, such wilderness uh, experiences, not to harm us, but to bless us. That's what we saw last week. But when we're in a spiritual wilderness of one kind or another, inevitably temptations will come upon us. Just like they did for Jesus here in this passage. So I want to take a deeper look at the temptations Christ faced uh, faces here in our passage and explore some of what that might mean for us. So here's the big idea I want to try and get across uh, this morning. Because Christ was victorious in every temptation he faced, we should look to him when we are tempted. That simple idea. Because Christ was victorious in every temptation he faced, we should look to him when we are tempted. Now it says in the book of Hebrews that because Christ has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Hebrews 2.18. What this means is that Christ's Christ trials had something to do with us. They're not just merely a part of his own suffering, but at least in part has the goal of helping us. So when we read this and we think, what in the world does Jesus being tempted here have to do with me? Christ was tested and tried for many reasons, but one of those certainly was so that he could help us when we are in our difficulties and trials, so that he could understand more his human nature. Paul says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, listen, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Right? So let these words be a comfort to you in whatever you're facing right now. But our afflictions, our trials, temptations, struggles have a purpose. And a part of that purpose is so that we can help others when they're facing similar struggles. And no doubt that was true of Jesus as well. Just as we saw last week, God is doing a good thing. And yes, it is true that the powers and the principalities, the demonic realm, which is very real, I assure you, will will come often in our trials to try and harm us or mislead us or destroy us, God's goal in the struggle is not to tempt us away from faithfulness, of course. We're going to take a look at James here in a little bit later on in the, in the message. We'll talk some more about a uh, passage there about how God doesn't tempt us and what that means. But what tempts us is ultimately our own sinful desires. We're going to touch on that. God's goal and desire, however, is to use the trials and the temptations to test our character and to refine us. And what that means is that often when we're in the wilderness, um, things that are in us, places that are in us we did not know will come out. Things are revealed. Sometimes those are good things. 
But often there's some ugliness and some mess in there too. So when we're in a spiritual wilderness, if we're going to get through it and survive it and grow and mature as Jesus did in his sufferings, there are some things that we're going to need. Okay, And that's going to be the thrust of the message this morning, looking at the things we will inevitably need when we're in the wilderness. And I've got three things that I see in this passage that we will all need when we are tempted in the wilderness. And the first one is this, endurance. Endurance. Point number one, because Christ was victorious in every temptation he faced, we should look to him for endurance when we are tempted. Take a look at verses 2 and 3 in our passage this morning. For 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Well, what do you think when you listen, you hear that temptation from the devil? What do you think the primary temptation is for Jesus in that moment? What do you think was at the core of what Jesus was being tempted with there? He's incredibly hungry and he's alone. And at this point, he would have been near death. Satan tempts him with food to start. Would it, been, would it have been wrong for Jesus to turn the stone into bread? Was that sin? Was it wrong? No. Jesus is the one who turned water into wine at the wedding of Cana in John 2. Many of you know that story? It wasn't wrong or sinful for Jesus to take some natural thing and turn it into something else. He did it in other places. What about eating? Has there been something sinful about Jesus eating in this moment? Well, obviously, there's nothing wrong with eating, per se. We all have to eat. Jesus was fully man. He needed to eat to live and survive as well. So what then is going on here? What is exactly the temptation? There's nothing sinful about either of those acts. What is the problem here in this particular case? Well, some theologians will argue, and I think this makes good sense, that it's because the fasting from food was a specific part of the test that God had given to Jesus. So somehow, being full of the Spirit of God, Jesus knew that this was an appointed aspect of these temptations, that he was to fast and have no food until he was released from that command or that obligation by God the Father. That was an appointed command. And if Jesus would have broken that command and eaten food, um, it would have been uh, disobedience. God desired Jesus to suffer in ways, and thinking about why, why in the world would God ask Jesus to fast in this way for that length of time, bringing him to the near point of death? Why? I think it's safe to say that God desired Jesus to suffer in ways so that many across, in, in ways that many across the world have also suffered. At this point, Jesus, again, as I've said, would have been near starvation. He was on the brink of death at this point when the devil comes in. And Jesus knows that kind of pain now of being right on the brink of starvation because of this experience. But I think it goes even deeper than that. It's not just about Jesus feeling certain kinds of pain or going through things that many in our world have gone through, are going through. I think it goes even deeper. It's not just the pain of starvation. It's the pain of not being able to lift yourself out of it. It's the pain of real, deep food insecurity is what we might call this. The pain that so many poor in our world and even some here in our own area know even right now you're hungry and you can't do anything about it. Most of us just go into the kitchen, stand there with the door open. Right? You ever done that? You don't know what to do? You got a few minutes on your hand, maybe you're bored, you just go and stand with the fridge door open. There's a pile of stuff there. My kids tell me all the time, there's nothing to eat. I'm like, what? What did I just spend $300 at the store on then? Nothing to eat, Dad. We don't have this kind of problem, right, that many in our world do. This deep food insecurity, not being able to lift ourselves out of it. Most of us just go in the kitchen, we've got everything we need there. 
but many do not. Estimates that I came across recently say that over 2 billion people in the world still do not have enough food to eat on a regular basis. 2 billion people out of the whatever 7.5, 8 billion people that are on the planet. Many of these people, when they're hungry, they don't have the means to just get a bite to eat. They can't just go get something. They're dependent on forces outside of themselves to eat, right? Economic forces or the mercy of others or, or things like that, or, or crops and all sorts of things. Well, in this moment here in Luke 4, Jesus is tempted by Satan to cheat. He's tempted to use an unfair advantage to make bread and relieve his struggle. He was on the brink of death, and Satan challenged him to just make bread. Of course, Jesus could do it. He's the Son of God. He could have done whatever. He did not. But Jesus knew something. He knew that the path that God had given him to walk on was not an easy path. Jesus was the Messiah, the long-awaited one who had come to deliver people from sin and death. And in order to do that, he had to obey God perfectly in every way so that his perfect record could be credited to us. We cannot stand before God without a perfect record. And Jesus came for all those who would believe in him to have a perfect record to present before God one day without any holes or cracks, kinks in the armor. Fully perfect record. But if Jesus were to do that, he couldn't cheat. In other words, he had to face all the things that people, humans, like us, face. What good is a perfect record of righteousness if Jesus cheated to get it? I'll just make a little bread so I can get through this trouble. I'll use my divine side to help my human side here get through this struggle. Well, you and I don't have that privilege or those resources, do we? And Jesus came to represent us perfectly. You guys remember the steroid controversy in baseball? I'm kind of picking on baseball today. <laughs> some of the big home run hitters and even some pitchers were caught using steroids to enhance their strength and recovery time. They did things that were never, had never been done before because of those drugs. Some guys are hitting 65 and 70 plus home runs in a single season, which is amazing. And then they got caught using these testosterone-enhancing uh, drugs. What did baseball do in response to the records that some of those guys set during those years? Did you know? What did they do? They put an asterisk next to their names or whenever the record is mentioned. Okay, so it's kind of like in, you know, some of those guys obviously were really ticked off about it, which, you know, I can kind of see both sides of that conversation. But Jesus has no asterisk next to his perfect obedience. Whenever his perfect righteousness is mentioned, there's not a footnote. Jesus did everything right, but on this one thing, he cheated. He used his, his divine prerogatives and resources to help him through this struggle. Jesus refused to cheat. He said, no, I will obey all that the Father has commanded me, and I will do so as a perfect man in his human strength and human resources alone. And because all of those whom he came to represent only have those resources. The poor, starving people across the world cannot manifest bread with a mere word like Jesus can. So Jesus said, I will enter in fully into those trials and temptations and embrace them without reference to my divine nature in any way, triumphing completely as a man over the trials. So the deepest temptation here for Jesus, again back to that question, what was the deepest temptation here? It was to escape the hard path of obedience that God had laid for him as a man. He needed endurance. He needed endurance. And we now have that endurance offered to us in trial because of the faithfulness of Jesus. Because there is no asterisk next to the name of Jesus. Because he did not cheat. I don't like that word, but you get what I'm saying, cheat. Jesus can now say with perfect authenticity, he understands. He gets what you're dealing with. And because he understands, he can help us in our human weakness. 
And not just in the struggle with starvation or food insecurity, but in every way. We don't have time to get all into that this morning, but Scripture does say Jesus has been tempted in every way, which is hard for us to conceive of with just the information we have in the Scriptures. But that's what the Scriptures teach. So that's the first point. Because Christ was victorious in every temptation He faced, we should look to Him for endurance when we are tempted. That's point number one. Now let's look at the second thing we will need when we are in the wilderness facing trials and temptations. Wisdom. Because Christ was victorious in every temptation He faced, we should look to Him for wisdom when we are tempted. Again, let's look at verses 5 through 7 now. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And said to him, To you I give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. At first I... I think maybe for many of us this passage or this part of the passage may seem really strange. We think, isn't God the one with all the authority over these things? That's where I go. Why is Satan giving authority here? Or saying he has authority? How can he say that he will give Jesus power? Well, the scriptures do teach that Satan is the ruler of this world. If you see passages like 1 John 5... Verse 19, it says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Or 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, which says the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. That's Satan, the lowercase g, God of this world. And also check out John 14, verse 30. I'm going to recite that one here. But Satan is the ruler of this world. Notice verse 6, though, from our passage today. I want to point out a a little piece. Verse 6. It says that, Satan says that his power, he says, I will give you all this authority and their glory, for it has been what? Delivered to me. By whom? Who delivered the, the authority, the glory, the power of this world to Satan? God, of course. And whoever gave him this power is the real ruler and real authority. It comes from God. God has given Satan these these things. Jesus, of course, does not, and and God has his purposes in that, and we're not going to explore all of those interesting theological uh, concepts. We'll touch maybe very briefly on some of this, but God has given Satan a measure of authority and power. Jesus, of course, does not take the bait. He knows better. But again, I want to ask, as we think about this temptation, what is the real underlying temptation here? It's not really power that's the test or the temptation. For two reasons. I want want you to see that. We think he's being tempted with power. That's not the temptation. Two reasons here. First of all, because Jesus himself is God and already has all the power, right? Right? He's already got it. Again, these things were given to Satan for a time. And second, all the kingdoms of the world will one day worship Christ in the future kingdom of God. So Satan is not offering anything to Jesus that is not already coming to him or his in some way already. So what is the temptation here? I think, once again, the underlying temptation Trial or temptation here is a shortcut. It's a kind of cheating. Satan is inviting Jesus to receive that power and worship that is already his and is coming to him, not through the path of lifelong obedience to the Father, but through this apparent shortcut. Yeah, all this is coming to you, but you really want to walk that incredibly hard road and go to the cross and deny yourself for all this time? Just have it now. Now. I'll give it to you. But here's the thing. Jesus has wisdom. Jesus knew some things that allowed him in this moment to triumph over the devil. First of all, Jesus knew the word. right? Jesus knew the word of God, the truth of God. We won't be talking about it in any great detail this morning. 
Uh, we're going to spend next Sunday looking at the responses of Christ and how Christ fights using the Word of God. That'll be next week. Um, but Jesus knows the Word. We see that clearly. He's responding to all of these temptations with this knowledge, with this truth. He's confronted with a temptation, and boom, he comes back with the truth of God's Word. Jesus was wise. He didn't just know the Word, but he knew how to use it. That's wisdom. He was wise and knew how to wield the word in spiritual combat. That's the first thing. Second thing that Jesus knew was that suffering was not something to run away from. We talk about this a lot because it's in the Bible a lot. I think maybe sometimes I, I say, why? why do we talk about this so much? And I keep coming back to that. It was everywhere in the scriptures. Everywhere you go, we hear hard things. We hear talk of suffering and struggle. I think we tend to think of suffering as evil, something that should be avoided at all costs, and certainly we can say suffering is a result of evil, no doubt there, were it not for sin, there would be no suffering at all in the world, right? That's when death and pain and all of those things entered the world, was uh, when Adam and Eve disobeyed and God cursed the world and responded righteously with his judgment, um, but it's not the suffering or the pain itself that's evil. In fact, pain can be a powerful tool in the hand of God for good. It can be a really, really powerful tool. Jesus knew these things. In fact, Jesus had already learned some of these things in the sufferings of his first 30 years on earth. Just being in, incarnate and coming down from heaven would have been a trial of magnitude for Christ. Hebrews 5.8 says that Christ, quote, learned obedience through what he suffered. That's, I know that's a head-exploding thing. How does God learn? I, you know, and, and this is speaking from a human perspective, it's human nature. But Christ, in this moment, was aware that the suffering he was walking through in this moment in the wilderness was a part of God's plan for him. And that he was only growing and increasing in wisdom and knowledge through these trials. The wilderness can be a school for us too. It can be a place where we grow and learn in wisdom, if we will let it be. As I said last week, so many of us, I think, and again, speaking for myself here, I'm human too. We're all clothed in the same flesh. I get the struggle, right? Speaking for myself here too, very, very much. We spend so many of our days avoiding pain and difficulty. And the result of that oftentimes is that we are stunted in our growth and we lack wisdom. So many of us are not wise because we spend too much time trying to wiggle out of any struggle or pain or difficulty. The best road, take this with a grain of salt here, this is a very broad stroke that I'm painting with here. The best road is rarely the easy road. <clears throat> Jesus said that we should all seek to enter through the narrow gate. This is in Matthew 7. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many enter through it. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. You. you hear that? It's a hard way. Few of us will be tempted with power. Very few of us have, you know, some, some opportunity like this where I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. But all of us will be tempted with escaping hardship. Every single one of you will be tempted with that trial. As a result of our walk with Christ. If you are a true Christian, truly following Jesus, you will be tempted to wiggle out of some difficulty and pursue an easier path. You, you will be. To give you a small example of something from my own life. This is a silly example. I know there's this thing that popped in my head the other day. I was at the corner stop. At the counter. Picking up a couple of sausage biscuits. And there was a lady. I was actually getting them for one of my, my children. And a lady I'd never seen before. Standing by the counter. Making conversation with folks. She said something like this. Those things are going to kill you. And I was like. Hey, I'm Josh. Nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, you're my doctor? No. Uh, 
That was just being silly. It was, it was a really, a really kind of joking, friendly conversation. But she said, "Those are going to, you know, those are not good for you. Those are going to hurt you. Eat too many of those things." And I was like, "Yeah." I said, "Well, they're they're for my uh, for my young and very thin daughter uh, who could you could stand to put on a little weight." Uh, anyways, it was a funny kind of back and forth. But then she said, "Why don't you just get?" Uh, you know, one of those Easter chocolate bunnies that was right there. And I was kind of, well, I don't know if that's much better, but... Um, and then she had this, like, like moment of conscience where it was kind of like, well, I don't want to assume you're into Easter, she said. She said, so if you're into that stuff... You know, and so she kind of had this moment of like, well, maybe I've offended this guy. And there was this pause, like this awkward silence. Um, and as I'm kind of formulating, how do I respond and not make this super awkward and... And I was kind of tempted to avoid the whole subject, you know, of Easter and faith and all that stuff. And I said, well, I said, I'm totally great with all that stuff. I said, I'm a Christian pastor and, you know, Easter's a big deal for me. That's what I said. And, uh, and then I said, and my kids had enough chocolate at home too, so. Um, we ended up having a great conversation for two or three minutes after that. But the temptation in that moment, right, it's very real to say, do I want to go in a potentially controversial direction? And... And, uh, and maybe avoid something hard or awkward or something that might lead to some kind of discomfort or, or pain even. Again, that's a silly example, but you get my point with what I'm trying to say there in that example, right? Wisdom, however, comes from walking through hard situations and it takes wisdom to walk through these hardships and these moments. If you don't have it, then often you will succumb to the temptation that Jesus did not succumb to. You just want to escape the difficulty and just get out of it instead of continuing on the road of obedience. Christ was victorious in the wilderness and Christ will give us wisdom to navigate difficulty if we look to Him when we are there. But we must take a cue from Jesus. Be in the Word and don't resent the wilderness. Don't resent the challenges of life. Embrace them and allow God to teach you. Wisdom will come. And that's point number two. The next thing we will need um, to navigate the trials of the wilderness. So we've seen we need endurance. We've seen that we need wisdom. The next thing that we will need to navigate the trials of the wilderness is abundant grace. Okay, And endurance and... <laughs> Wisdom are gifts of grace, um, but you'll see kind of what I mean here when I say abundant grace as we go through. We should look to Him for abundant grace when we're tempted. Okay, let's look at verses 9 through 11 now in our passage. And He took Him to Jerusalem and set Him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to Him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now scholars say that the pinnacle of the temple, depends on what part he's talking about, but a lot of scholars have a particular part in mind of the temple, and they think that this, this uh, particular area of the temple, that was kind of close to the Kidron Valley, would have been about 300 feet above the bottom of the Kidron Valley. So this would have been quite a pinnacle. Our steeple here, I think, is a little over 90 feet. So we're looking at, you know, three, three and a half times that height. This would have been a significant height. And the devil misuses Psalm 91 to try and manipulate Jesus to get him to do this wild thing. I mean, it sounds really out there, you know, okay, jump off and let him catch you. And, and he's using scripture to try and prompt Jesus to do this. Well, what do you think would have happened if Jesus would have performed such a feat? If he said, oh, you know, what the heck? Let's, let's do it. What, what, would have, what would have happened? Well, it would have probably earned, maybe earned him a rather large following, right? Let me go up to the top of the temple. There's all, the people, all these people around. Hey, guys, look at me. Look what I'm about to do. I'm going to prove to you I'm the Son of God. The angels are going to come down and grab me and save me. People would have been like, Whoa! Right? They would have been blown away by this. And Jesus would have probably gained quite a following from such a feat. But again, thinking of the underlying temptation here, that would have short-circuited God, the Father's plan, for Christ to have Jesus earn 
his following on the path of suffering and obedience, which ultimately led to the cross, right? This is a short-circuiting that process. But here we get another glimpse into the way temptation works and the way that the spiritual forces of evil and darkness, the devil himself, the prince of demons, the way they want to get at you in temptation. Think about this test here with me. Maybe the deepest desire in God's heart is worship. And that's, and that's a good desire for God because God is the being in the universe that is most worthy of our worship. It is right and good and appropriate for Him to call us to that. And we've been made and designed for that so it's good for us and best for us to worship Him. But His deepest desire, perhaps, is that worship. That His creatures would come before Him in worship. Now Satan here is attempting to use that Desire that good thing in God against him, right? And to twist it. The forces of darkness in our world will do the same in their strategies to harm us as well. Think of there are good desires often inside of us. And we will be tempted with those good desires in a twisted way. Often. We see this in James chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. If you have your Bible, I want to flip there really quickly. James chapter 1, 12 to 15. I'm just going to read it here for us. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Now listen to this. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. What this passage reveals to us is that it is our desires that lead us into sin. Some of those desires can be good desires that are used and twisted. The forces of darkness, including Satan, can only do as much as our desires allow them to do. God will sometimes lead us into the wilderness to reveal these desires. Not to tempt us. God doesn't tempt us. He <coughs> tests us. I think it's a better way of looking at this. To reveal and expose our true character. Some of the men, we were talking about this at men's group this morning, God already knows what's in there. He knows our hearts. He's doing this in part to reveal things to us. So we better know ourselves. So we can see who we are, our true character. And it's in the spiritual wilderness where our true selves are often revealed. Where we begin to understand our deepest longings, our pains, and our struggles. And we're naive if we think that anything we feel and think and do is good. Right? We are not by nature good. We are evil. Most often what comes out of us, especially in the wilderness, is not good. What this means is we must pray for grace in the wilderness. Abundant grace. Okay? There's three levels of grace that I want to, or three aspects of this I want to speak to. First, grace to see our sin and to accept it as sin. Right? We've got to stop writing off our sins, justifying our sins, clever explanations, seeing ourselves always as the victim. Oh, how our culture is overrun with the victim mentality. It's always somebody else's fault. We've got to receive and embrace what we've done as our sin. Take responsibility. So we pray for grace in the wilderness to do that. And then we, when the sin is out there, okay, when the sin's out there, we see it. We say, okay, God, my desire has led me into this. I've messed up. I was wrong. I've contributed to this. Then we pray for grace to repent of it and turn. Right? To say, I see it. I was wrong. I'm sorry. And turn. And turn. 
And finally, this is also very important, we must pray for God's forgiveness and receive His forgiveness. Okay? Some of us sin and mess up and then we grovel and then we waller in the, in the guilt and the shame on and on and on. No. God forgives. God is grace-filled. We receive His forgiveness. Isaiah says, Let the wicked man forsake his own way and the unrighteous man his own thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Isaiah 55, verse 7. See your sin, repent of your sin, receive God's forgiveness. In the wilderness is an opportune place for these things to happen. So that's the third thing we will need, is abundant grace in the wilderness. And here's the good news, people, as we, as we conclude the word for today. In the wilderness, Christ succeeded everywhere we failed. Everywhere we failed. Where Adam and Eve failed, Christ succeeded. They were tempted by the serpent, the devil. Christ was tempted by the serpent. Christ succeeded where they failed. And where you and I failed. He perfectly obeyed the Father. He perfectly resisted the temptations of Satan without cheating. Jesus chose the hard way of obedience, fully as a man that his perfect record might be given to us. We don't have to be perfect to receive it. We don't have to succeed under trial or go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil himself. All we must do is put our trust like a child in Christ and in what he's done for us. As we put our trust in Christ more and more, we find that over time our desires begin to change. More and more we find ourselves able to resist the temptations that come our way and instead of trying to escape trials, we begin to look for God in them and the wilderness becomes a place where we commune with God. All because Christ himself was victorious in the wilderness. Amen. Amen. So as our musicians come forwards now, I want to take us to the Lord in prayer. Go to God in prayer. Lord, we, we desperately need you as we continue to walk through a wilderness of many sorts globally. And God, here locally, there's so many challenges that face us. We are very much in a, maybe even a literal wilderness, but spiritual wilderness definitely. And God, we come to you. We need endurance. We pray for endurance. We look to Jesus who... Uh, uh, God endured even to the point of death and we are reminded that in him we too can endure we pray for wisdom we pray for the wisdom of the word and how to apply it but also that we would allow our trials and these wildernesses to give us wisdom to teach us be our teacher Lord in the wilderness and finally we pray for grace Lord as we bump up against our own sin and our desires as they lead us astray and as we lock horns perhaps with the dark forces of evil, we pray, give us grace. Grace to see our sin, to acknowledge it, to repent of it, and then to receive your forgiveness. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.